All right. So we are live on our YouTube channel and then we'll just wait till 6 p.m. And maybe wait a couple of more, like two, three minutes. Okay. So now uh, YouTube, let me go check the YouTube link. Sure. Yep. Yeah, let's see what it shows. Do you have multiple screens? Okay. Is it one more? Mm -hmm. No, it's not. I only have that open on my control room of YouTube and that is mute. I don't know where is this coming from. Okay. Let's see. Do you have multiple screens? Okay. I'll yeah. Sorry? Oh, I think I got it. I got it. Never mind. Okay, so I uh, I think when I click on the screen, the Microsoft, the Internet Explorer starts, which is not my standard uh, okay. yeah. internet yeah. using place. So it just opened up from there. <laughs> I see. There are a couple of folks who uh, want to join from California, but I think it's too early. Good morning, too early for them. So they will, yeah. they will like, we'll just check the live replay. Yeah. That's pretty cool. This is good. Yeah, the global skill strategy part would be very relevant to California workers. Yes, yes, absolutely. Is the music playing on your side or is there there's little noise outside or is it from outside? Oh. No, I just wanted to make sure there's no like noise disturbance. Yeah. That's fine. Can you hear the noise now? All right, it's 6 p.m. We'll just give a couple of more minutes, like two, three minutes more, and then we'll start. Yeah. Yeah.
will retweet your repost. All right, I think we can start the webinar now. Uh, are you ready, Guru? Yeah. Okay, awesome. All right, so hello everyone. Welcome to the live streaming of the live webinar on Voting Pass for Success channel. Uh, we have got a lot of questions from people who are thinking of planning to immigrate to Canada. And there were so many questions, not only from people in India, but also so many questions from people in USA because of the widely changing laws and people are getting uh, confused and uh, they want to want stable immigration options. So I thought this is the best time to do this webinar and uh, address all your queries and questions that you have. And uh, so before we go ahead with this webinar, I would like to take a minute to talk about what Voting Pass for Success is. So, uh, so yeah, uh, if, if I talk about me first, I'm the founder of Voting Pass for Success. I'm an engineer myself and a speaker as well. Uh, I have also got work experience uh, working in, in Canada as well for three and a half years. Uh, and I also taught, used to teach in SVNIT back at home in Surat. Uh, I did my master's there in University of Waterloo. And uh, I started Voting Pass for Success with a passion to help students and especially engineering students because I'm an engineer myself as well. And uh, in order to bridge that gap between academia and industry uh, to help them with choosing the right career options and that too directly from the people who are into different fields. So uh, that was the motivation because there are so many options out there what students can do after BTEC and students are often confused as to which is the right career path for me. And uh, sometimes even when students know what they want to do, they have no clue where to start from or they think, where do I get that right information from? So keeping that in mind, um, we started taking interviews of engineers and researchers in India, USA and Canada. And uh, we interview them about how their career journey has been. We talk about what is what are the industry requirements uh, what are the important skills? What are the important projects that students should focus on? How's the job market? And we have covered different industries like robotics, uh, cybersecurity, artificial intelligence. And you can see here, like we already have 16 interviews out there from different uh, diverse fields of STEM. So uh, for all the students, all the parents, all the people connected to STEM, you can just subscribe to the Voting Pass for Success YouTube channel and you can get all the updates. Uh, we have tried to cover people from various different industries like Amazon, Google, uh, Arista Networks, people from MIT, Stanford University, IIT, University of Waterloo, WPI. So there are, you will find a one like different perspectives of different people from all these different industries. And you can directly go to the video description. We have timestamps under each video. So you can just click on the particular timestamp uh, related to what question you want to go to first. Uh, we have conducted seminars for over 3,000 plus students uh, in Gujarat as well as in Mumbai. And uh, we have been giving seminars on inspiring engineering innovation, uh, robotics applications around the world and related uh, webinars that would be helpful to students. Uh, we also have a robotics collaborator, Jayam Patel, who is in USA and he gives online mentoring sessions to high school as well as engineering students. So if you want more information, you can just visit our website here, which is www.codingpass.life. And uh, today we are going, uh, coming back to our topic, we are going to talk about um, what questions you have related to immigration to Canada. And we have with us today, Dhru Sharma, who is a registered Canadian immigration consultant and is also a robotics engineer. He's currently doing his master's 
from University of Toronto and also has done his bachelor's from University of Waterloo in Canada as well. So being in Canada, seeing uh, what laws apply over there, studying there, uh, guiding uh, students and people there for immigration, he has good experience of understanding what Canada, uh, how Canada as a place is, how Canada is a place to immigrate as well. So uh, he has uh, been, uh, he has founded the, he is a founder, sorry, he's the founder of Efficient, uh, where he provides services on Canadian PR, work, study, visit. You can just contact him for all these services. And here I have also provided the phone, email, and the website of Everything Services. And you can also find all these details in the description of this video. So uh, also one thing that I would like to mention is Dhruv is going to provide information. Uh, and if you want direct legal advice, then I would suggest that you uh, contact him one-on-one -on -one, and then he can give you more legal advice, which is on a one-on-one -on -one platform. So uh, I would recommend you to save these details uh, in, in order for you to contact him. So yeah, without taking further time, I hand it over to Dhruv Sharva. Uh, thank you so much, Dhruv, for uh, sparing your time and uh, coming live with us on our YouTube channel uh, and addressing people's questions for immigration to Canada. So thank you so much for being here and I welcome you. It's my pleasure to be here. Thank you, Kushbu, for organizing this. Awesome, awesome. Uh, so Dhruv, I'm going to stop sharing my screen and I'm going to let you share your okay. screen. I'll share my screen now. All right, awesome. So all to all the viewers, we have already got a uh, list of questions from different people. So we are going to address those questions first. Meanwhile, you can use the live chat option to uh, write down your questions that you have and we'll address them uh, at the end of all the questions that we asked through. So feel free to write all your queries in the live chat. Yeah. So, uh, mm -hmm. so just to just to begin with, um, just to um, give a motivation for starting this company uh, on from my side. Uh, basically because I've been through the education uh, system in Canada and I was myself an immigrant here. Um, I've been through the process and I understand what uh, it takes to uh, go through the process and what uh, Canadian education is like and what are the stresses and challenges involved in the process. So uh, that's why I ended up starting this company and getting my license uh, for uh, a Canadian immigration consultant. Um, and the vision is to help uh, aspiring immigrants, uh, be it uh, people who want to work in Canada, be it people who want to settle permanently, or be it uh, students who want to come here to study um, and then settle, uh, to give them a clear pathway uh, and to give them uh, transparent advising in terms of what their uh, immigration uh, needs how, or how their immigration needs would be met in the future, uh, given they take the path they're taking right now. And a lot of the times I've seen that um, I, I, I'd seen in other countries and especially the United States, students end up coming uh, and spending a lot of money on education. Uh, and then there is no clear pathway to settling down in the country. Um, so that's my idea that hopefully I can reach out to as many people as I can and give them an idea of um, what immigration in a country like Canada looks like and what options they will have once they finish uh, their education here, particularly for students and then for other applicants, uh, what the process is like. So yeah, um, thanks again, Kushbu, for organizing this. And now we can, we can begin with questioning. For sure, thank you so much for providing the, uh, your introduction and talking about Evisian. And I'm sure it will be helpful to all the people out there watching this video. Uh, all right, so to all the viewers, we have divided our questions into starting with first, uh, work permit directly on how to get work permit in Canada. Then we'll be talking about the study permit and then in the end we'll be talking about PR. So Dhruv, yes, let's start with the work permit as to how to apply for a Canadian work permit. Right, so um, basically Canadian work permit, uh, there are two different kinds of work permits. Uh, one is an open work permit, uh, which uh, essentially means that uh, you have that work permit and you can work for any employer in Canada. 
And the other one is closed work permit where you're tied to a specific employer or you could be tied to a specific industry. Uh, it, it varies, but for most applicants uh, uh, who would be interested in this uh, would be the applicants who are outside Canada and who want to uh, come work in Canada. So for them, um, the standard procedure is to find a job in Canada. So find a Canadian employer and then uh, that the Canadian employer will offer you a job. And then through that job offer, you will apply for a work permit. So in order to ensure uh, that foreign workers do not end up taking jobs from Canadians and Canadian permanent residents, uh, the Canadian government has um, set up the system which is called labor market impact assessment. Uh, in short, it's called LMIA which basically uh, is a system in place to uh, where the company that's hiring has to prove that there was no Canadian citizen or a Canadian permanent resident that was able to fill that position that you hired the foreign worker for. And uh, once you receive that positive LMIA decision from the government of Canada, then you can apply for the work permit. And uh, so the work permit process is simple. You just apply to uh, the Immigration, Refugees and Citizens of Canada, and then uh, they'll essentially uh, issue your work permit once your application is approved. Um, most of the uh, jobs require an LMIA, but there are certain jobs that are exempt or certain uh, category of people that are exempt from uh, the requirement for uh, LMIA, uh, such as, uh, for example, US citizens are exempt. Uh, because of the treaties between different countries. Um, but most of the people, for example, if uh, um, individuals are coming from India, then they would be required to have a positive LMIA in order to obtain a work permit. And um, so uh, recently uh, with all this, um, um, with things going on in, in the United States and uh, even other parts of the world, um, a lot of tech workers uh, who are on H-1Bs um, in the US are looking to come to Canada. Um, and in that case, um, there is a very relevant option called Global Skill Strategy, which uh, was a system that was put in place by the government of Canada that provides very fast processing for work permits. So it takes two weeks for your application to be processed. Uh, provided you have all the required documents that are needed for the application. Um, so, and there's, there's certain jobs that are listed in this, uh, in that, that come under this umbrella and all the tech jobs, for example, I'll show you here, um, all these uh, tech jobs such as software engineers, computer engineers, web designers, computer network technicians, all these are, um, all these fall under this, uh, this criteria. So essentially, um, especially for tech workers in, in, for example, in Silicon Valley or other parts, this would be a very relevant thing where you can, you can obtain a job offer and then come to Canada to work uh, through, through a work permit through this process. Okay, all right. So uh, let's say if a person wants to apply, uh, what would they search? What should they search for? Should they just search for global skill strategy and they would find the link? Yes, exactly. So, for example, over here, um, you can just say global skill strategy, and basically this is the first website. And also, I recommend always look at the government of Canada, Canada.ca websites. Don't look at other third-party websites. And then this will give you the process and eligibility requirements and how to apply. And that will give you uh, all the information. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I, I think this was a very common question that, you know, if, if, if their uh, immigration status in US is, is not that stable currently, maybe they will have to move to India first, then apply for PR. But I think this is a good way out. If they directly want to switch to Canada, they can just apply for the work permit first. And then they could go towards the road of PR. Exactly. So I know a lot of people uh, who took jobs in Canada and then moved to Canada on this, uh, uh, under this program uh, on work permits. And then once you're here, you're working, then you apply for PR. So you don't have to take a break or go to India and then come back. You can directly move to Canada from the United States. Okay. And also, and I, uh, sorry, yes, go ahead. Yeah, I was just going to mention because 
the Canadian and the American uh, work culture is very, very similar. It's almost the same. So it's easy for people who are working in the US to obtain jobs in Canada. Okay. Yep. Yeah. Uh, all right. So uh, that was about the work permit part. Guys, if you have any questions related to work permit, just write down your questions in the live chat and we can just address it uh, at the end. Uh, all right. So moving on to the next part, which is study permit. Like I know there was like a big fuss about the F1 uh, status in US recently. And I think it was again retracted, uh, which is a relief for all the students here in the United States. But in case if students need to have uh, an option that what if they are studying in the United States and maybe for better immigration or maybe better studying opportunities, they want to move to Canada. Uh, is there a way that they could do that? Yeah, absolutely. So uh, recently, because of all the restrictions with F1 that were put in place, but thankfully they were attracted uh, once uh, the universities like MIT and Harvard challenged them in the court. Um, but essentially, a lot of students I know from these top universities ended up applying for transfer to University of Toronto uh, and the University of Waterloo and the likes um, and move to Canada and complete their studies. Um, so the idea is that every university has a different process for transfer. But the basic idea is that um, every university will assess the credits that you've already obtained uh, in, in your prior university and they will assign you credits for the courses you've done. And then um, uh, basically either grant transfer or not grant transfer. And if you are granted transfer, then uh, you have a admission offer from that uh, particular university, uh, a Canadian university. And with that, you can just apply for a study permit. And once you are granted a study permit, you can move to Canada to resume your studies in Canada in a Canadian university or college. Okay, so basically, uh, do they still have to, uh, do their credits that they have taken, let's say, in United States University, would those credits transfer or do they have to start, start from scratch? Yes, so their credits would transfer. So it depends on every university would evaluate. So, for example, uh, you studied, for example, at, uh, say, Harvard, right? And then you apply to University of Toronto for a transfer. Um, so the student would apply with, uh, with their transcripts to University of Toronto and then the admission department at the University of Toronto would go over the transcripts and then match the courses taken at Harvard to the equivalent courses at the University of Toronto and the particular degree requirements and then they will assign credits based on that. And once, uh, once that is approved, then they won't have to do those courses again. Okay, all right, that's good. Uh... Uh, and also if students have any questions for uh, how to do this transfer, you can always uh, visit efficient uh, services or contact through Sharma. Yeah. And we have the contacts there, so you can get more details there. Uh, yep, yeah. uh, all right. So now what about, about the study permit or uh, study related uh, visa for people who are new coming from India or international students coming from India? So are there any updates on that? Yeah, so currently, yeah. Basically what's happening is uh, because of um, COVID-19 restrictions, um, the study permits are being processed, but there's uh, uh, the, all the online applications are being processed, but because of the other services such as biometrics and before medical was not happening, uh, and biometrics are still not happening in certain parts of the world. And India is one of them. India, there's no biometrics going on. Uh, so what's going on is that the applications are incomplete, right? So since COVID-19 lockdown began, uh, none of the applications were actually complete because people could not do biometrics, right? So, so it's we are very fortunate that the Canadian government uh, and the IRCC, which is Immigration, Refugees, and Citizenship Canada, has been very um, considerate of the fact that. Uh, of, of the COVID-19 situation and how it's impacting uh, international students. And they have made a lot of um, adjustments and uh, changes to their procedures to accommodate all of these uh, new changes uh, and rapidly changing things because of COVID-19. Mm -hmm. So essentially, uh, yeah, so basically all the classes for the fall are online. Uh, 
And since students can't really get a study permit right now, so most likely most of the students who are starting classes this fall will be doing them online and from their home country, uh, right? Um, so the question then is that uh, after you finish your studies in Canada from a designated learning institute, you are entitled to a postgraduate work permit, which essentially uh, is, is a work permit for you to work in the country for some time, right? And a condition for this postgraduate work permit previously used to be that any time you spent studying online courses, distance learning would not count into postgraduate work permit um, requirement, right? Um, however, because of these exceptional circumstances, everything is online. So the government said that, okay, we will make an exception uh, and for students studying online, uh, for, they made it for the summer semester and also they're making it for the fall semester. This would not impact their uh, postgraduate work permit eligibility, provided they do 50% of their studies inside Canada. So if you're doing a two year course, for example, right? Uh, so you can do up to one year online, uh, as long as uh, these COVID-19 restrictions are impacting you. And then once you are in Canada, you can finish the other one year uh, and you'd still be able to apply for a post-graduation uh, work permit. Um, so this is really good. And another recent update that came in, and this is very important for students who are actually um, doing their, uh, or making a decision right now, whether to start in fall or in January, or September or in January. Um, and the new update is that the government introduced, uh, I'll take you to the link here. Um, they introduced a two-step procedure to um, do the study permit uh, processing. Let me just search. Yeah, here. So the Minister of Immigration, uh, Mr. Minister Mendocino introduced uh, new um, policies and they say that um, now the study permit processing would be a two-step procedure. Uh, so there would be a temporary two-stage approval wherein you submit all your documents online, um, except biometrics, because that cannot be done right now. And uh, the government will up, uh, approve uh, your application in stage one. Uh, and once you submit the, uh, the biometrics, then you'll get the final stage approval. So essentially, if, um, mm -hmm. if you've completed an application, submitted a complete application and you received a stage one approval, it's very safe to say that uh, unless you have a prior criminal record that your fingerprints would uh, showcase, uh, you would mostly get approved for the final work per, uh, study permit, right? So once you have that uh, stage one approval, you can safely start your online classes and have the peace of mind that you would be able to uh, come to Canada later to resume your studies. Um, so yeah, um, this, is, this is a very important policy change that just came uh, like six days ago. Um, and uh, I'd recommend uh, anyone who has questions regarding this to contact us or check this, uh, this website uh, and it has all the information. Okay, actually that, that's a wonderful update because students are confused, like they have been asking, should we start the fall intake? Because first yeah. of all, there's a, uh, like there was no idea about what, like, you know, about the biometrics, like you mentioned. But uh, the important thing is since you can do 50% of your course, which is uh, online, you can do it from your home country. So yeah. I think uh, it's a good bet to start from the fall intake if students want to. Uh, but Dhru, I have one uh, question. Mm -hmm. uh, you did say that if the initial stage is approved, uh, so biometric shouldn't be a problem. Uh, but let's say that for a safer side, if, if students feel like, what if I don't get the work permit and what if I have paid the fees for the fall term? Yeah. Uh, so would you recommend them to start from um, January intake just to be on the safer side or should that be okay and they could still continue with fall? Yeah, so I was actually checking uh, for this for one of my clients who is a student who applied and got admission for fall. Um, so I asked the same question to the school and I said, what would happen to the fees if you start in, in the fall and the study permit is not approved? But unfortunately, if you're studying online, then they said that they would, uh, they would take the fees based on the hours that you've already studied and then refund the rest. Um, so yes, I agree that um, 
January intake is a safer option here so that you can actually um, you have the peace of mind or full surety that you have the study permit and then you're starting your studies um, and you're not wasting any money. Um, so it's, it's essentially a trade-off, a little bit of risk involved, um, wherein if you're studying from, uh, say, for example, from your home in India, then um, you're paying the same fee, but then you're saving on the living costs, which is quite considerable savings if you're living at home. Um, but then again, um, it's on case by case and you have to assess your um, application strengths uh, and uh, ensure that there is a high probability that you will get approved for a study permit if you are taking that route. Okay, all right. Uh, so yeah, that was it for the study permit for people who are coming from India, uh, new incoming students, and also for transfer of students who are into another different universities in US. So if you have any questions related to what we discussed about study permit, please go ahead and write your questions in the chat and we'll address them uh, at the end of this webinar. Uh, all right, so moving on, uh, coming about the permanent residence, which many people uh, are looking forward to. Uh, and uh, so, yes, can you talk first about how is this different from USA? Yeah, absolutely. So um, the Canadian permanent residence system is, is kind of a model for the entire world right now. Uh, the way Canada is bringing in uh, landing uh, immigrants, skilled immigrants, um, has been uh, very efficient and has been very um, helpful to the economy of the country. Um, and the idea is that uh, the Canadian uh, PR system is totally merit-based, uh, which means that uh, essentially um, all the applicants are assessed based on their skills based on their abilities in terms of their language, based on their age, based on, essentially it's, it's a combined uh, calculation that essentially measures how well would you contribute to the Canadian economy and the progress of the Canadian society, right? So um, that's how Canada assesses. And there is a very detailed uh, scoring system that uh, IRCC uses to assess uh, aspiring permanent resident candidates and then picks the top uh, the candidates from, from those applicants in order to ensure that they're picking the best ones. Um, so to contrast this with the United States, it's very different because the United States system, first of all, most of the immigration in the United States right now is family-based. Uh, and also um, the system in the United States is not merit-based. So like if you have a work visa, uh, for example, H-1B, you are eligible to apply for permanent residence. So there is no, um, there is no system for for merit that if if you've done this much education, you will have more chances, or you if you are this age, then you have higher chances. It's basically if you if you have the visa, then you get into a line, and you can imagine because there is no merit-based system, then these lineups are huge, and consequently, people from India, for example they have to wait 15, 20 years to receive their permanent residence just because, because these are huge lineups and like everyone has to uh, go through that line and uh, they, they just have to wait for, for this long in order to get a permanent residence or what they call it green card over there. Um, so that's the difference. Um, and also uh, Canadian in the Canadian system, uh, things are very decentralized uh, where, uh, uh, for example, there is a federal program which the federal government runs, uh, numerous federal programs, and then there's uh, provincial programs which uh, the provinces run based on their needs. Then, on top of that, there are regional programs uh, which uh, which are targeted towards different regions that have low people, uh, less amount of people, and which need to attract more people to run their economy. Um, and also uh, now there are talks for municipal programs at a municipal level so the cities can actually uh, attract immigrants. Uh, so, so, so it's very decentralized in that sense and there's numerous opportunities in order to obtain permanent residence uh, in Canada, which is great for aspiring immigrants. Yeah, yeah definitely. Uh, so let's say now people are interested to apply for PR. So the, we have a list of questions that uh, we have. So maybe we can go through that one by one for PR. 
Uh, the first question is, when is the right time to start applying uh, for PR? Right. So, um, so basically, the 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 way the system is, as I mentioned, it's merit based, right? And uh, a part, a factor in that is the age of the applicant. So, the younger the applicant is, the more that applicant is going to, to contribute to the Canadian economy in the long run. The younger the person is, the more probability is that the person will settle well and contribute. Uh, uh, Pay, pay more taxes uh, as, as they work in Canada and then uh, ha help the country grow, right? So essentially, uh, as, as you grow older, so up, up till 30 years of age, uh, you get the highest points, uh, highest score for, for, for the age criteria. But after that, for every year, the points for age keep going down, which means that if you're applying, if you're 40 and you're trying to apply, then you will lose uh, 10, year, you, 10 years worth of points for age you would have lost already, uh, which can be sometimes very hard to make up through other uh, work experience or through other skills. Um, so if you are planning on applying and you're young, um, under 30, I would say that definitely get started with the process and submit your application um, so that uh, you can actually obtain the maximum benefit in terms of the points. Okay, all right. Uh, just want to say that we do keep uh, we do see questions in the live chat, so just hang on to them and we'll address them um, after the end of the PR for when interested in this discussion. Uh, all right, so basically, like you said, it's 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 just better if you just start early as soon as you can. If you're looking for immigrating to Canada, just start as soon as possible. So I think the next question to that is um, uh, the IELTS exam. Uh, many of you, many of the viewers don't know that IELTS has like two exams, like the one that you apply for studies is academic IELTS, but the one for PR is the general IELTS category. So uh, when to give the IELTS exam and are these centers for IELTS exam, like do you have to go to these centers or are, are these online because of COVID and you can give these exams at home? Right. So um, first of all, very good point that for the immigration purposes, it's not the academic IELTS, it's the general IELTS, which is different from what you do when you apply for admission in a college or a university. Um, and yeah, so for the IELTS exam, uh, answering the first question, when to give the IELTS exam? So whenever you are doing any immigration process for permanent residence in Canada, it's the requirement for almost every single uh, stream uh, that you need to do the IELTS uh, before you, you start the process because IELTS is one of the factors, a big factor that contributes to your, that's basically tells you about your language ability. And then there are score, there is score associated with how well you communicate in English, right? Um, so before you start any process, uh, the first step is to do your IELTS exam and also doing your, um, whenever you do your IELTS exam, the higher score you can get, the better it is for you uh, because the more points you would be awarded. Uh, we'll talk about the comprehensive ranking system later on in this uh, webinar. Um, and essentially IELTS plays a big role in there. Um, so I'll show you uh, the language equivalency chart uh, so that you can get a better idea. Um, so here's the language equivalency chart, right? Um, and this is for IELTS, right? Um, so the government basically uh, divides uh, the language proficiency by CLB, which is called Canadian Language Benchmark. And CLB scores have corresponding uh, IELTS uh, uh, scores in different modules. So if you want to score CLB 10, which will award you the highest points uh, in terms of uh, your score calculation, um, you need at least eight in reading, uh, 7.5 in writing, 8.5 in listening, and at least 7.5 in speaking. So if you can score this or above uh, in, 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 in the modules, then, then you are golden, right? You, you cannot do any better. Uh, but basically this will give you an idea of uh, what's the minimum you need in order to hit a CLB. So this is a very important resource. Um, so uh, because of COVID-19, the IELTS centers were closed. Um, however, um, government is not accepting the, uh, the online IELTS uh, so far. So you do have to go into the centers. But now uh, 
since the lockdowns are being lifted in certain countries. And I know uh, for sure in India, especially in Punjab, um, the IELTS exam have been uh, starting. Up, uh, so uh, they're being offered in person. So um, you will have to go in person to do these exams. Um, which are either you could do computer based or paper based, but uh, it has to be in 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 person. Okay, all right, uh, all right. So yeah, people who want to apply for PR, the first step, like Dhruv mentioned, is to get an IELTS date and maybe take an IELTS date uh, exam date within like uh, maybe three months or so, depending on when you get the av availability, and you can start preparing. I think. It shouldn't take more than a month uh, to, I guess, be completely prepared for IELTS, right? It really depends on the person's abilities. Um, so it depends on how comfortable you are with English. Um, for example, when I did my IELTS exam, I studied for two weeks, but uh, that's because um, I always studied in English and my education was in English. So it's 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 very different for me, but. Um, like it really depends uh, but usually I, I know people end up taking like a few months like two to three months to kind of practice and uh, for, for the IELTS exam I, I just recommend doing a lots and lots of practice there's lots and lots of practice online and the more you do uh, the, the better you'll get at it um, and that's that's the way to succeed in IELTS. Okay uh, all right so the next question was about uh, for PR is it mandatory to have work experience to apply for PR? Yeah, so um, almost all the programs um, um, that are, that administer PR in Canada, uh, work experience is a requirement. Um, could be one year, uh, minimum one year, mostly uh, for, for all of them. Um, and yes, the more work experience you have, the higher the points you have. Um, there are very specific programs, but that's usually for international graduates who just graduated, um, where you might be able to uh, obtain a PR uh, or be eligible without work experience. But usually any foreign worker uh, or any foreign uh, applicant uh, who is not in Canada, has not, never been in Canada or worked or studied in Canada, you need minimum one year work experience um, in order to be eligible to apply for a permanent residence through the Federal Skilled Worker Program. Okay, all right. So it is mandatory at least to have one year experience and it's not necessary that it should be in Canada. It is okay if you have that one year experience in India as well. Am I correct? Absolutely, yeah. So, I mean, depending on uh, if, if your work experience was Canadian, then you will obtain extra points because it's Canadian work experience. Um, however, even if it's foreign, you will, uh, you will be, it will make you eligible uh, under the immigration program. Uh, and uh, if you have three years of foreign work experience, that's the maximum points you can get. So, so that's another thing I usually say that for, for people who just, for example, finished their education at 25 and they worked three years uh, and are around like 28 years of age, uh, that's a golden opportunity for them to apply because age is with them and they have finished their education and they have the maximum points they can get for work experience and there's nothing better they can do after that. So so that's basically uh, the, the correct time. Uh, but yeah, work experience is, is needed for, for any application that we have. Okay, all right. Uh, so the next question is about evaluating your degrees. Uh, like, can you throw some light on what does it mean by evaluating degree and when to get your degrees evaluated? Right. So degree evaluation basically means that um, different parts of the world have uh, different uh, ways in which education is done, different standards, different practices. Um, and degree evaluation basically is say that you did uh, a degree in country X. Uh, how does that degree uh, compare to a similar degree or a degree or education performed in Canada itself, right? So say that you studied engineering in India, then you get your degree evaluated um, and see if that degree is actually equivalent to a bachelor's degree in engineering in Canada, or it's equivalent to maybe a three-year diploma, right? It, it really depends. Um, and 
the evaluation is usually done through accredited organizations. So the government has been uh, accredited uh, um, a few organizations. Um, let me try to find. Yeah, here. Uh, so these are the designated uh, organizations. Uh, um, there are five of them. World Education Services or WES is one of the most commonly used uh, for applicants outside Canada or mostly in India. Um, and essentially what, what uh, you do is you send your uh, degrees uh, and uh, related documents to them. They have databases uh, which they will use to assess how your degree uh, compares to a uh, degree in Canada. And then they'll issue a document saying that this is your degree and this is the Canadian equivalency. Um, now that Canadian equivalency is what uh, the Canadian immigration is going to consider when assigning you points under uh, the express entry, for example, or under uh, the permanent residence scoring system, right? So uh, just like IELTS, uh, you also need uh, your degree evaluation. Otherwise you would not know what your score is and you would not be able to apply. Um, so that should be done. So I, I usually say that once, you're, once you've made up your mind and you start preparing for IELTS, uh, Around the same time, maybe uh, you should get your degrees evaluated so that uh, you can uh, you can save time. And then once you have the evaluation and once you do your ask, you can just apply for uh, for the permanent residence. Okay, all right. Uh, so yeah, this was a very important point. And uh, now moving on to the CRS uh, evaluation. Can you mention what CRS is and how 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 is the weightage of points on different aspects of the application? Absolutely. So um, in the beginning, I mentioned that Canadian immigration system is a merit-based system. Uh, and basically CRS, which is the comprehensive ranking system, um, is a way of measuring uh, that merit for each applicant. And CRS basically evaluates uh, each applicant's score for uh, based on different factors such as age, education, work experience, language proficiency, et cetera, right? So I'll show you uh, different CRS factors here um, and uh, I'll give you a better understanding of what exactly CRS is. So here, um, this is a Government of Canada website where it gives you the CRS criteria for express entry. And express entry is the federal program that the government has. Uh, to to get for foreign or any any PR or any immigrants on a permanent resident status inside Canada. Um, so uh, if we can see here that um, the the comprehensive ranking system basically awards points for age, education, language proficiency, Canadian work experience, and then uh, if you have a spouse, then with your spouse you can obtain additional points based on spouses level of education, uh, language proficiency and work experience, Canadian work experience. And then thirdly, they see how well your skills that you already have will transfer to, uh, to the Canadian marketplace or Canadian job market or the Canadian economy, right? So they have uh, uh, these criteria, right? Uh, that um, if you have, a, what kind of degree do you have? What, how much foreign experience do you have? Do you have uh, any certification from one of these provinces uh, in, inside Canada, right? And then that will uh, provide you additional points. Um, and then also if you have uh, a close relative, like a blood relative, um, that would be your brother or sister living inside Canada. Uh, and that has to be like your real brother or sister, um, then you can get additional points. Uh, um, and also, um, if you know French, uh, that's a big uh, game changer. If, if you can do French exams, then uh, you can beat a lot of people uh, because you'll get instantly a lot of points for that. Um, so essentially, uh, this uh, uh, page over here gives the entire breakdown of CRS uh, or comprehensive ranking system and how the scores are awarded um, based on each criteria. Uh, so I encourage if you're interested to know more um, visit this link. Um, you can just Google CRS uh, Canada and you essentially uh, get a link to this. And this, this will provide you entire scoring system. Okay. So, uh, yeah. And then there's also, you can calculate your CRS score by yourself. 
Um, and there is this uh, CRS calculator um, that uh, government has already provided. Uh, uh, so all you need to do is go into this tool and start filling in your information. For example, if you're single, um, how old are you, put in your age, your level of education and so on. And then essentially at the end, once you fill, fill in all the information, they will give you your computed CRS score. And that CRS score will tell you um, how eligible you are uh, based on the previous rounds that were made or previous cutoffs by, by IRCC. And that'll give you an idea if, if you have enough points to immigrate to Canada. Okay. Uh, so we had one uh, question regarding this, that if it is a couple, a husband and wife are applying for PR, uh, and if husband is the primary applicant or wife is the primary applicant, does the other, ha I mean, the partner has to give IELTS exam as well? Yes, they will have to, yes. Um, because then only their points for the um, for IELTS or, yeah, the spouse points will add up once they, they, once they do that. Otherwise, they won't get that. So okay. they do have to. Uh, there are options where you can, um, so th there's two options. Either you can say that your spouse will accompany you to Canada, or you can say that your spouse will not accompany you to Canada. If the spouse, you say the spouse will not, then the, the, the spouse would not have to do that. Um, otherwise the spouse will have to do that if you want your spouse to accompany you to Canada as permanent residence. Okay, yeah. all right. Uh, all right, so now if students, uh, you already provided different links uh, on where people can get these information on Canada.ca website as well. Uh, can you also provide the link on where they can start their application? Oh, yeah. So here is the link for uh, the express entry profile creation. Um, I'll show you uh, over here. Um, yeah, so it's again a very simple, um, it's a procedure where you um, it, this tells you how to create the profile. Uh, and you start with, first of all, uh, answering some eligibility questions uh, by checking your eligibility. And once you're eligible, then you will get a number. Um, so this is for if you're applying by yourself. If you're using a consultant, then we have a different interface to do that for you. But essentially, if you're doing it by yourself, then uh, you will answer the eligibility questions. And then you'll get a code uh, which you'd use to create your profile. Um, and essentially the profile creation requires an online account. Uh, you can create your express entry account here. Uh, if you don't have an account, you can register. If you have an account, then you can sign in. And then in there, you will put in that code that you obtained by checking your eligibility. And then that'll basically populate your information. And then um, you can add in more information. It's, it's a very detailed uh, um, information questionnaire that you have to fill in which talks about your prior work experience, your education, everything about you. And then after that, once you've done all of that, that you can submit the application uh, into the pool uh, for, for the next draw, whenever that happens. Okay, all right. Uh, so now also many questions um, are related to PNP. Many people have questions related to the PNP program and how does that affect, is it a part of express entry itself that we will get more points if we have PNP or is it like just a separate PNP system on its own, which is separate from express entry program? So uh, PNP essentially is a provincial nominee program, which uh, basically means that every province, uh, the federal government has given uh, the right to every province to decide what kind of immigrants they need or they want. Um, and based on their needs, uh, every province will uh, select immigrants uh, to immigrate to their province in order to boost the provincial economy, right? So for example, if Ontario needs tech workers, they will uh, create a special program or they'll essentially uh, pick more tech workers uh, to, to come to Ontario. Uh, and what happens once you go through the PNP option is, that uh, once you the, the, you apply for a nomination, uh, that's why it's called provincial nominee. Uh, so you apply for a provincial nomination and that nomination is based on your work experience, your language ability, your age, and all the same factors for CRS. And then the province is gonna give you a nomination if, you, if you're successful. 
what that nomination does is that nomination instantly provides you 600 points uh, towards your uh, express entry profile. 600 points is going to uh, beat any cutoff uh, for express entry because the current cutoff is last cutoff was 478 um, and 600 is going to beat anything and then you're good to go. You, you basically, once you receive a nomination, you will receive permanent residence if unless there are other problems, for example, medical or criminal and in disability, right? Um, so that's the, the PNP option where you can essentially um, apply to provinces. Uh, if the provinces need uh, the, the skills that you have uh, at, the, at, the, at that particular time, then you can apply for, um, apply for those. Uh, provinces and then if you're lucky they will uh, pick your profile and they will award you nomination um, so and then there is multiple ways of applying for PNP uh, it could be done through express entry profile itself uh, wherein uh, once you submit your express entry profile uh, you uh, you give uh, the uh, consent to provinces to consider you for uh, nomination um, and once you do that, then uh, the, nom uh, the provinces uh, themselves look through the express entry pool of candidates and pick the ones they need uh, based on the labor needs. Um, or you can also apply directly to the province uh, through, it, it depends on the province, but some have paper-based applications and some have online applications through the provincial uh, government websites. Um, and so, so there's two options. Um, so the PNP uh, option is very relevant for some people, especially foreign applicants who don't have uh, uh, any Canadian work experience and who are not meeting the federal program cutoff scores, but they, they have work experience in a skill that a province needs. For example, um, I'll give an example of Ontario. Uh, Ontario recently did uh, uh, a tech draw, which is targeted towards uh, people in tech. Right, um, so software engineers, computer engineers, uh, programmers, web designers, and all. Um, and uh, basically, if you have experience, if you had experience and you had an express entry profile, then you would get a nomination under this uh, tech draw, right? Uh, which is excellent for for people who are not meeting the required scores under the federal program. Uh, they can immigrate on through the PNP uh, nomination. Um, yeah, so that's essentially a very rough overview of how PNP works. Okay, all right. I think there was... Uh... Okay, uh, all right. So in, in case students or people have more questions related to PNP, you can again reach out to Dhruv. Um, and th there is, even I applied for uh, PR and I, I know that there is like so much of detail oriented that we need to have we need to make sure everything is in place everything is up to date and according to their standards so uh, if you need a consultant to apply for PR and be rest assured that you know your application gets through and is correct and uh, you don't need to you don't want any delay where they ask for more information because it was wrong or maybe not that accurate so you can just uh, reach out to Dhruv and we have already provided details uh, regarding that. So I think that was the question that these were the questions that we had up till now and uh, we have so many questions so we can maybe uh, start addressing those questions. Yeah, uh, one thing I wanted to mention uh, on that note uh, is um, usually when you're dealing with immigration, uh, if you're dealing by yourself, you should be very careful uh, because immigration is it can be finicky. Um, the department itself is they have so much, uh, so much workload, and um, they cannot uh, like they cannot accept your uh, documents one by one. So you have to. It's recommended you make sure everything is in place properly before the application goes in, and everything is done properly. Because if things are misplaced or if they're not proper, then it would cause unnecessary long delays. Um, and the other thing I wanted to mention is if you're using help, external help, uh, for example, a consultant or a lawyer, <clears throat> it's very important that you make sure that they're licensed. Now, how can you make sure that they're licensed? 
if they are a lawyer, then they will have, uh, you can ask for their license number and you can check the corresponding law society for that province. And if they're a consultant, uh, I'll show you how you can check if they are actually licensed consultant. Um, so it, this is uh, the ICCRC, Immigration Consultants of Canada Regulatory Council, is the body that licenses the consultant uh, that regulates the profession inside Canada. Um, you can go to their website, iccrc-crcic.ca slash find a professional. And in here, you can write the last name and first name. Uh, for example, here I put in my last name and my first name. And then you go down and search and you will get uh, the, the name, the status, and it should say active. Active means that the consultant is currently licensed and is in good standing with the organization. <clears throat> and also it will give the license number. So please make sure um, that you check this because I've seen numerous cases where people used um, consultants, unlicensed consultants, especially in India. And those unlicensed, if those unlicensed consultants make a mistake on your behalf, government assumes that it was your responsibility and you take the blame for all of that as applicant. But unfortunately it was not your fault. However, you were the one who were paying a price for that. So please, uh, uh, make sure that you're using a licensed consultant because once you use a licensed consultant, uh, you will be uh, signing a form saying that that consultant is your representative and the immigration department would know that um, that consultant is acting as your representative. And then they're more, uh, even, if, if, even if something was incorrect in your application, it does not, the blame does not Tip to you, and you don't. You're not liable for these these things uh, that could actually make you inadmissible, for example, to Canada for for a period of five years, which I've seen happen to people. So yeah, so just just to give an idea, you can basically check any consultant over here uh, um, to make sure they're licensed. Yes. Yep. Yeah. Definitely. This is one aspect that we need to consider seriously uh, because then all your otherwise all your efforts are in vain. So. Uh, make sure you do this step prior to your application. Uh, so Dhru, we have a list of questions that we have from people so we can start addressing them one by one. Uh, okay, so the first question is, what about the students who are graduating from universities in US, like from a master's degree and are on OPT for now, but risk not getting H1B? What are their options in Canada? Yeah, so that's a very good question. Um, <clears throat> essentially, um, the students who graduated from with a master's at, in the US, they, they are working on OPT. If I'm correct, they can work up till for three years on OPT um, before their chances run out and then they have to leave. Um, so my, uh, uh, my suggestion always is that once you're working in the US, uh, uh, assess your eligibility for permanent residence is, because you're getting work experience, you are eligible um, and keep uh, your options, uh, consider your options to apply directly for permanent residence, right? So keep exploring those options. And at the same time, um, you are working in, in the US, uh, you can either uh, find a way to transfer from, for example, if you're working in a multinational company in the US, you can transfer from the US office to the Canadian office. So for example, I know a lot of people um, who, who, uh, who were working down in California, they would transfer into Toronto, in the Toronto office. So that, that's an internal transfer and you can basically move to Canada on a work permit and do your uh, work here and then get PR, um, pretty straightforward. If you cannot transfer, then you can find a job, uh, right, um, in, in, in Canada and move to Canada on, on, on a work permit and then apply for, for PR. So, but I, I, I would recommend that you do both things simultaneously where you keep checking your PR eligibility and if you're eligible, submit your application while you um, uh, try to find a job or transfer into the Canadian company because uh, once you have your profile in, you can always update it later on uh, with new information. So once you get a Canadian job offer or you get Canadian work experience, you can update it later uh, and that will basically lead to an increase in points and then, then it would make it easier to get PR. Okay, all right, yeah, makes sense. So basically uh, start applying, uh, start looking for jobs and if best if you have a company 
whose office is in Canada, that would be a good transfer as well. Yes, and in parallel, keep considering your options to apply directly for PR. Okay, all right. Uh, the next question is, how can a para paramedic go to Canada? Is there like a separate procedure for people in that field? Um, no, it's, it's very similar, right? Uh, just like any other profession, you have to obtain, um, if, if you are going as a permanent resident, you have to make sure that your uh, particular category is uh, one of those, uh, uh, come into those NOC 0A or B, which are skill category jobs, which I think paramedics would. Um, and then you basically apply for, uh, you can apply for permanent residence. And if you want to go on a work permit, then you have to find a job. Uh, I think for paramedics, it would be a little easier. Um, however, it's a little hard for doctors because um, they need a lot more licensing to get a job. Getting a job as a foreign doctor is very hard because of the regulations. Um, but I think paramedics, it's a little little bit more flexible. However, there's still uh, like regulations involved. Um, so it, it becomes a little tricky in, in the medical field. Um, but you can regardless apply for uh, permanent residence directly because your, your jobs do fall into those uh, skilled job categories. Okay, all right. So maybe after they come here, after PR, then maybe they have to apply for some certifications or give some exams. Exactly. You know, yeah, yeah. So a lot of, for example, I know a lot of doctors who immigrated as PR and then once they came, then they had to go through three, four years of education to get their license to practice in Canada. Um, so yeah, yeah. You sh I think it's the same for paramedics. And also, I mean, uh, if you are, um, if there's no other option, then coming in as a student is always a good option where, you know, you come as a student into the country and you study in the country for say one or two years. And that's very helpful for you to understand how things are in the, uh, how things are done uh, in inside of Canada, right? And then once you, as a student, it's a lot easier to integrate into the economy and also to get through your immigration uh, pathways. Okay, all right. Uh, so the next question is, uh, is it advisable to apply for PR while one is on a study permit in Canada? Oh, yes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. So if you have, um, if you have the required points, then you can, yeah. If you meet the eligibility criteria, it's recommended that you uh, submit your profile. Um, and then if you're invited, uh, then, then apply. Yes. There's, there's, there's nothing in the law. Uh, uh, avoiding you from doing that or preventing you from doing that right but maybe they it's it's better for them to wait because they will have the canadian education points and uh, also the uh, yeah, other points. but does it have points that after you graduate from university canadian university does it add more points to a pr yes it does um but uh, i know a lot of people who basically um for example they did their education in india bachelors and they started working three years and they came to Canada uh, to do more education, right? But while they're doing their education, they already have enough uh, uh, points uh, to apply for PR. So in that case, uh, by all means, just uh, apply. And it's actually good if you are, if you get your PR while you're studying, then your tuition fees will also go down and uh, it would make uh, everything easier for you. So for sure, uh, you should if if you if you're meeting the requirements, then I it's recommended that you apply as soon as possible. Right. So if you are doing bachelor's and then directly coming here for masters uh, to study, then it's not a recommended option. But like Dhruv mentioned, that if you have work experience already in India and have those points, which he also mentioned, how you can check your eligibility, then you can go ahead. Yeah, as long as you meet the eligibility, then you can go. Right. Okay. All right. Uh, okay. Uh, how much stability one can have in Canada? I, I'm, I'm assuming that's related to uh, getting jobs, salary. Uh, yeah. That's that area. Yeah. Um, I, from my personal experience, uh, I've lived, I've been living here for now seven years. I know people have been living here for 15 years or 20 years. And I have not heard a lot of people complain about uh, not being stable um, or life not being stable. Uh, the economy is pretty good. Um, jobs are stable. Um, the the more the biggest instability in any other part of the world is 
you losing your job and you having to leave the country and go back to home, uh, be it uh, be it the United States, be it any of the Middle Eastern countries, um, right? So in Canada, uh, if you have your status uh, in place for PR or if you're a citizen already, then um, you you are basically good, right? Uh, in terms of immigration and even for jobs, right? Um, as far as I know, the economy is good. So um, once you it's up to you how to get a job, but uh, I have not heard people complain a lot in Canada about stability, lack of stability. Yeah, right. yeah definitely. Even the government policies are like this COVID-19 was a perfect uh, example of how, uh, how government has supported uh, their citizens where they are giving away $2,000 a month without any questions asked uh, to support uh, um, their citizens or their uh, people, uh, right? Any person who was working in Canada was eligible to obtain that $2,000 of support. And uh, along with that, uh, all the policies that they made regarding immigration, regarding travel, regarding education, they were all completely in sync with how the situation was evolving. Unlike, um, I hate to point fingers, but uh, unlike the United States where schools are being pressured to open up using the uh, leverage of uh, sending students back, uh, international students back to their home country, um, where you see a lack of synchrony, uh, any lack of sync between the university and, and, and the administration, right? So that kind of things hopefully don't happen in Canada, which is, uh, which is a blessing here. Right. No, definitely. I totally agree because uh, uh, even when, uh, so when I came to Canada and was working, it, it felt like home. I did not need not worry and be paranoid, uh, which a couple of friends that I had in US were, were worried because they have like the H1B options for three years. And what if it's not selected? You know, the green card pathway and everything. So I think for Canada, it, it feels more like home because they welcome you in a way where um, you feel comfortable enough. Uh, and then it's upon you to, you know, make your way. Exactly. I know a lot of students, uh, uh, actually friends of mine who ended up going to prestigious American universities. They spent uh, maybe uh, $200,000 on education, which comes out to be over one crore Indian rupees, right? And no H1B, so they have to go home, right? So that's like a situation that's uh, terrible, right? So you take loans and you spend so much money. And then right. how do you make that money back um, if you are not living in, and working in the country? Definitely. And I think one more point that I would like to address is uh, even when my PR or work permit or anything was going on, I could still visit my home country. I need not worry that, you know, whether it, it would be a problem coming back. Uh, yeah. So even, even that way, is, you won't feel like you are stuck and you will have to stay here till yeah. you get something. Uh, it's fine even if you leave country and come back as far as all your legal documents and visas are valid. I think it's it's okay for you. Yeah, absolutely. All right. Uh, okay. So the next question is about IELTS score for engineering. Uh, so yeah, how, how much should be the IELTS score for engineering? For engineering? Uh, so, I mean, it really depends what university and what program you're applying to, right? So a lot of the top tier universities don't even require IELTS as long as you've studied English uh, as your first language during your schooling, uh, right? So elementary and high school, uh, like University of Waterloo or uh, University of Toronto, they don't really need IELTS, right? Uh, however, um, it depends on the school, right? Uh, usually any student who aspires to come to Canada, uh, we recommend that you should get at least at least uh, 6.5 uh, overall, right? That's the safest thing. If you can't do that, then at least six in each, not no less than six in each and 6.5 overall average band in IELTS. Um, but in general, the higher you can, uh, the better it is. Uh, but uh, again, for engineering, usually the requirement is higher. Uh, and it really depends on the on the university. So, like based on what you're interested in, and what universities you qualify for, we can basically check uh, what the IELTS requirement is and uh, how you can uh, what you would need to to apply for, for admission. Right, right. 
Uh, so yeah, like Dhruv mentioned, I, and I think for international students, especially people in India, um, I think they on their university website, they have given the minimum criteria as well as if your country requires IELTS score. So uh, please do check, like especially people in India, they do have to give IELTS exam. I, I give my IELTS, I give TOEFL. So even TOEFL is fine if you give TOEFL yeah. exam. Yeah. Uh, but make sure that you read uh, the uh, the university. And, uh, yeah, instructions on the university website because that that, that is where you will get all the information. Yeah. Uh, all right. So the next is if if one has given IELTS academic for masters, and then if one wishes to apply for PR, are we supposed to give IELTS general in spite of having given IELTS academic? Unfortunately, yes. Yes. yes yeah, you have to. Yeah. Don't make the mistake of sending academic results. You won't be accepted. Uh, right. They won't be accepted. Yeah, you have right. to unfortunately do the general again. Yes. Right. Uh, okay. So, how many hours can people work? So, I'm assuming that if you work, come on work permit, how how many hours can you work? Oh, so um, so if you are uh, on a study permit, then you are permitted to work twenty hours uh, per week. Um, and uh, there are certain exceptions, but in general, 20 hours a week. So keep that in mind. You don't exceed that. Uh, if you're on a work permit, then you can work 24 seven. No one's stopping you. You can do whatever you want. Okay. Yeah. All right. Okay. So I think the minimum uh, hours are like 40 hours, right? Which is considered as full time uh, work. Uh, uh, 40 or 37.5. I mean, uh, yeah, at that point, it's okay. Um, that, that's considered full time. Yes. Um, okay. But yeah, when, when you're studying, you can't work full time. So then 20 hours is the limit per week. Right, right. Uh, all right. So the next question is, uh, so Indian work experience is considered as foreign work experience? Yes, Indian okay. work experience will be considered. Any work experience that's not in Canada is foreign work experience. So be it United States, be it India, be it China, be it your, uh, anywhere in Europe, Australia, New Zealand, it's right. all yeah. Okay, so you can be rest assured that it, it is counted as one of the criteria. Yes, but you need to have proper documentation to support your work experience. So it can't be like uh, you just get a letter from your family business saying that you were working there. Um, there has to be proper documentation to support that you are actually doing what you what you claim you're doing. Right. Yep. Uh, okay. Uh, could you please tell us more about uh, the dual intent clause in? express entry application. If your application is already in the pool for PR and one has uh, not received ITA, can you apply for a study program? Yes, yes, you can. Uh, dual intent is allowed uh, as per law. Um, um, so yeah, once you have uh, your, your application is in the pool, there's no ITA. So uh, immigration essentially does not have your uh, Essentially, your application is not with immigration; it's just in the pool, um, and you can still apply for uh, for a study uh, a study program. Yes, um, the only thing uh, usually uh, there are certain times when your application for PR is in process, and then you are coming in as a student. So, so there are very specific cases where we advise not to leave the country, but. Uh, in this case, it won't affect you because you, you you haven't even received the ITA. Uh, you can do whatever. You can apply for another study program. Okay, so it, it won't. Uh, so yeah, it won't be a point of conflict, right? No, no. So you, you, you essentially uh, usually if if you are hiring legal counsel, then uh, they can frame a submission letter saying that um, what your intentions are in terms of uh, studying, right? Um, and you basically uh, tell them that and it should be fine. Yeah. Okay, all right. Uh, the next is, what is the minimum points one must have to get PR? So it, it changes uh, uh, every, every draw um, and it really depends on how many immigrants they pick and what kind of immigrants are in the pool at that time. Uh, last draw was 478, the cutoff was 478 uh, on July the 8th, I think. Um, so yeah, currently that's the cutoff. Um, there will be another draw, I think, in a couple of days, uh, maybe on Wednesday or Thursday, hopefully, and we will see what the new cutoff is then. Okay, all right. 
uh the next is our full time paid internships uh which are not part of your curriculum be considered as work experience so this is a a good question um it uh, it it can be evaluated on a case by case usually if it's inside canada then uh, internships are not considered um for foreign work experience they are sometimes considered um uh, as as a work experience um right uh, and if they are not a part of curriculum they are likely considered but uh, we have to evaluate on 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 the case by case basis to see how it falls uh, into the work experience category right right that's very true because uh, i also remember like people said that no the work experience has to be something that you do after you graduate like full time and yeah. sometimes they said no internships is fine so i, I think again like you said it's like case by case it varies yeah 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 okay all right uh the next question is about um i have heard having masters degree from us do not need ielts is it true for for pr application it's not true no matter what degrees you have you still you might be a phd you still need uh, ielts um right. maybe if you're applying for your masters degree and you need to apply for a uh, phd program in canada or a master another master program in canada you might not but it really depends on the university that you're applying to uh, but as per immigration requirement and as per the requirement for permanent residence application ielts is mandatory no matter what education you have even like if you have a master degree in canada you still need to do ielts uh, in order to qualify for pr uh, application right right so ma- no matter what apply uh, i mean you need ielts and also make sure that it is general ielts exam again uh, it's good to keep repeating those words is general ielts so that it's it's in your mind that it's not academic one exactly uh, all right uh, so the next is uh, for crs do they consider internship work experience along with full time experience which i think you covered up in your previous question yes yeah. well. that uh, Uh, yes they do consider internship for experience case by case whether did you do it outside of canada uh yeah it's very uh, yeah it's very discretionary so it's better that you like contact us directly to to get that information otherwise it's wrong i don't want to give out wrong information to the okay uh and i think just the last question is uh, a student is saying it would be really helpful if you could provide the links to the website that you just showed for the points calculator eligibility criteria and all so i think uh, after we we are done and once this youtube video is up then we can uh, in the description of the youtube video we can put all those links uh, yes. for uh, public to actually use them and be able to access them right right definitely we can we'll also put be putting those links in the description and uh, you can also go on uh, i mean google and just type the words because i think cic website is pretty uh, straight forward so i think they directly it lands you to those pages as well in okay. case you so uh, yeah i think and we have been get, getting great comments from people that it was very informative and it has been very helpful for them so uh, thank you so much dhru for uh, sparing your time and uh, giving yeah. all this important information out there Yeah, it's my pleasure. It was really great to answer all these questions, and I'm glad we had so many questions from the audience. And also, I'd just like to repeat again that uh, please don't take what I said as legal advice. It's all information that we are giving out. And if you have certain specific legal questions or require required legal counseling, then contact us directly, and then we could do legal counseling on a case by case basis. Uh, but yeah, thank you. Thanks a lot to Boarding Pass for Success. Thanks, Kushbu. uh for organizing this and i'm i'm hopeful that it was helpful to to the masses to the audience definitely definitely and to all the viewers if you still have more questions just feel free to write them down in the comments as well and we'll get back to you and uh, thank you for being a uh, part of the live uh, webinar and don't forget to subscribe uh, for boarding pass for success channel so thank you so much everyone thank you dhru once again thank you very much it was my pleasure Okay. Are we not live anymore?